Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to watch our videos. And we do pray that God would use these to bless and strengthen His people. Strengthen our faith. Strengthen our commitment to serve the living God. And to trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for our salvation. We continue here to look at history. History of the Word of God and the history of the church age. We are still in this here of looking at this false doctrine of transubstantiation, which was introduced by Catholicism. And we're here in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. And uh, we'll back up here to verse 38, and we'll read down past verse 44 where we're currently at. And it says, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me, should I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which saith, or which every one which seeth the Son, and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus then murmured at him, or oh, Jesus, oh Lord help me. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father, which hath sent me, draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, And they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. As this very rather lengthy discourse, which we continue on in here, as he sets before us these teachings, as he talks about that bread of life, and that bread also that came, which they ate in the wilderness, that manna, and he speaks to himself being that bread of life. And as we remember again, that doctrine of transubstantiation teaches that the Eucharist, or that bread, literally becomes the flesh of Christ, and that wine or that cup, which literally becomes the blood of Christ, this being contrary to the teachings that are set before us in the Old Testament, and that from the very foundation and that law first mentioned, and the first time the blood is mentioned, that in that the blood is the life thereof, the blood and the flesh is the life thereof both of man and also of the animals which have blood. Some creatures in this world, insects and things, don't have blood like that. But of the animals which have blood in them, that blood is the life thereof. And from the beginning, that law first mentioned was that the blood was not to be eaten, it was not to be drinking, it was to be poured out on the ground. And later when the law of God was given, the law said it was not to be eaten, it was not to be drinking, it was to be poured out. And that the soul that did so was sitting and would be cut off from the people. Herein then, if Christ is teaching literally it, that his flesh is the bread, or the, that his flesh is literally what we're to eat, his blood is literally what we're to drink, then he is sinning against God, against God's laws, and he cannot be your Savior. But this is an allegory. It's symbolic. The bread of life is symbolic of his flesh, or the bread of the supper, is symbolic of his flesh, which was tore for our sakes, which suffered for our sakes. The cup is symbolic of his blood, which was shed for our sakes to redeem us from all our sins. 
For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And as he sets these things before us, and he gives assurance that all those that are his, again, will be saved, and they will be saved because the Father draws them. For if the Father does not draw them, they cannot, they will not, because they choose not to come unto him. The old nature of man is a nature of sin. Man is in darkness in his natural undone state. We are in darkness and we love that condition of our life. We love our deeds and our deeds are evil. But Christ came to save us from our sins. He suffered and died on the cross to save us from our sins. His body was tore. His bones were not broken that it might fulfill prophecy. His blood was shed to save us and redeem us from all our sins. And as he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. If you truly believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're saved. Now I see those today out there on both sides of an issue here, what we would call, what some of you, well, they say, well, they're Calvinists. And the others say, well, you're Armenians. And I see, brethren, I see people on both sides of this issue pointing the finger at the other side and saying, Oh, you can't be saved because of your doctrine. Even though both sides believe this verse right here. They believe that he that believeth hath everlasting life. He doesn't say here that your doctrine has to be pure, that you have to have all your ducks in a row, that you have to know exactly everything my word teaches to be saved. But what you do need to know is that you're a sinner and that you're condemned because of your sins and that Jesus Christ has set before you a way of life that you would believe upon him who suffered on the cross to save a people for his name's sake. He paid their debt. And if you believe, you trust upon him, as your Lord and Savior. And truly from the heart you do believe and trust on Him as your Savior. It's not just a mental knowledge that you well, you know of someone called Christ and what somebody said He was your Savior. You're going to trust what they said rather than truly, truly trusting the Word of God. And there is that work of rebirth in your life where you can say yes. I was convicted of my condition, of my life, of my sins, and I was caused to repent. And it's not just a changing of your mind. It's a changing of the way you live and the way you want to live and of your thought process of how you no longer think upon the things of the world, but you think upon the things of God and you desire to be pleasing in sight so you seek to study and to learn and know the Word of God and to grow there in. You don't have to know the truth about baptism to be saved. You don't have to know the truth about the Lord's Supper to be saved. You don't have to know church truth either to be saved. Brethren, you don't have to know the truth about election to be saved. You don't have to know the truth about predestination to be saved. Yes, you can not know many things and still yet be saved as long as you just have to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. Repent and believe the gospel. And the longer you live from that point on, you're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord if you submit yourself unto learning, studying the Word of God, and listening to the right men of God, the men of God will lead you in the right direction. There are many out there who want to lead you in the wrong direction. There are many on both sides that have only hatred for those on the other side of the issues, not just in the doctrines of grace, but also on the ordinance of the supper and the elements that are used therein, uh, the type of church doctrine that's taught, and many other things I'm sure we could find where there are those who sit on two sides of an issue, pointing fingers across the fence to people on the other side say, oh, you can't be saved. You're a heretic because you don't believe like I do. Hell is not given unto me to know your salvation. He said, make your own calling and election short. Make your own salvation sure. Make sure in your own heart and mind that you know the Lord and that you truly do believe these things. You're submitting yourself unto God and you, you desire to learn what thus saith the Lord. And don't let anyone tell you here when it says something, it doesn't mean it. It does mean it. Or when he says there again in verse 44, No man can come to me. Why? 
because they're in darkness, and they love that darkness because their deeds are evil or have a condition called depravity. And yes, it's total. It's total. So, oh, but what about that free will? Adam had free will. He didn't know what good was. He didn't know what evil was. He didn't know the difference. But he had one commandment given unto him. God said, don't eat of that tree. He broke that commandment, and thereby he knew the difference between good and evil. We know the difference between good and evil, and because of that, we have a nature that is influenced by sin, we are not free. We're not free from the power and influence of sin. We cannot help but sin. We do not have a will that is free from the influence of anything. And thank God that the Father, as he said, except the Father which has sent me to draw him. We who are under the influence of sin, we are, who are in a state of depravity, we are influenced by that, but also the Holy Spirit of God influences us. It draws us unto God. It woos us unto Him. And yes, He quickens us, makes us alive, opens our eyes to the truth of God's Word, gives us ears to hear the truth and to believe the truth, and understand that He will raise us up at the last day. And it's not by the ordinances that we're saved. It's not by baptism. It's not by the Lord's Supper. It's not by church membership. It's not by marriage. It's not by any of these so-called sacraments. This here so-called sacrament of the Supper is corrupted. And as we've talked about this church, I don't think we've got to it yet in this study here online. But we're going to deal with that term sacrament also eventually. And Yeah, that's ahead of us. We're good. We deal with the term sacrament eventually here. We've done it at our church. We're about 200 years, I think, ahead of this, or three, about 300 years ahead in our church study where we're doing this there. And we've already covered it, but sacrament is a word that should not be used in relationship to any ordinance of the church. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, either one. They're not, or, they're not sacraments. They're ordinances. They're not oaths which we take. They're not oaths which we commit unto God as a soldier commits an oath to service and to do the will of to do that which is commanded him by his generals. It's an act of obedience unto God. Baptism is a submission unto God, submitting ourselves unto baptism because we have been saved. Submitting ourselves and observing the Lord's Supper because we are remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life, his body, his body was tore for us even as that uh, bread is tore and broken up that we might consume it he is that bread of life that true bread of life and he is that true life there's no life there's no saving power there's no grace in the supper no saving power in the bread or the wine or the whatever juice you're drinking uh, we do realize that some use grape juice some use wine uh, but historically, brethren, if you're going to be honest about this, you've got to look back and see, and you understand this, that before Prohibition, there was not hardly anyone who used grape juice. They all used wine. Even you Baptists. All of us. It says, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. They ate that manna in the wilderness. They're dead. They're, they're not alive still yet. They, did, they didn't get preserved, did they? So it tells us it's not the people that are preserved through the ages, but it's the work of God. But we know that we are secured in Him unto everlasting life. This is the bread which came down from heaven that a, that a man may eat thereof and not die. But yet they died. It's talking about having faith, not in yourself, not in what you have in this life, but having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to keep you eternally, and that if you do die, He'll raise you up at the resurrection. I am, he says, there in verse 51, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Now, are those that deny this, he's saying, I came down from heaven. I was with the Father, even. He declares unto us that he was with the Father before the foundation of the world. But was what Jesus was? No, not Jesus. The Lord was. The I am. He is that second part of the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, Jehovah God, Father, the Word, the Lord. The Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of God. All three of those are seen in creation. All three of those are present there when they said, Let us go down and make man in our image. And then they went down and said, Let us go down and see what is going on with man. They judged there at Sodom and Gomorrah. 
or not Sodom and Gomorrah, but the Tower of Babel, and the Trinity of God set before us in these things. Uh, and uh, if there is not a Trinity here, if the Father and Son are not two distinct persons, then this is a lie, this is dishonesty, the way it's wrote. You Pentecostals, you oneness, you Unitarians need to understand these things. It's so, all oh, that God is one. God is one. Yes, one God. But if there are not three persons in the Godhead, then the word of God is dishonest. You make it to be a lie. You make God to be a liar. And you make him to be a God who is uh, impotent. He's impotent. You made him, he's created, he's put himself in a corner. He's created a law in front of him which he cannot cross, he cannot break, which says that he needs three, uh, two or three witnesses to condemn you to hell. And if he's just one person, he can't do it alone. Now, your fathers did eat man in the wilderness. Well, we're up to that, uh, that 51. It says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. The bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, we know you're not literally eating his flesh. But you're eating that bread, which is symbolic of the flesh, his body, which was tore, which died for us to save a world, to save a people. For his namesake says, I will give for the life of the world. It's the life that is set before and offered, yes, to all mankind, if they would but repent and turn to him. But on their own, they will not, they cannot because they love darkness, because their deeds are evil. They are lost and undone in their sins, they're spiritually discerned, they're depraved, they're wicked, and they will not on their own turn to God. But He is that bread of life. He is that one. He's that life that's set and lifted up before you that you might believe upon Him and turn from your sins. And those pricks, that effectual calling of God, if there is an effectual calling in your life, you can feel it. You can feel it. You say, oh, I feel my heartstrings being pulled. I feel myself being pulled in. That is the Holy Spirit of God. Yes, the Godhead in fullness working to bring you unto Him and He will finish what He starts. You will get there. Your eyes will be opened, your ears will be opened, and you'll see yourself lost and undone without God or His Son, and you'll cry out unto Him, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, a sinner! And we'll be, oh, uh, Lord, I believe you now. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to keep on living like I live, but I'm going to change my mind, and I know I'll be fine. No, it's not that simple, brethren. You can't just change your mind. You've got to turn from your sins. Oh, uh, you know, and there's those brothers. Oh, but you can't turn from your sins. You can't see sinning. You're going to say that the whoremonger can keep on being a whoremonger and be saved? You're going to say the murderer can keep on murdering people and be saved? Can you keep on being a thief and be saved? If you're convicted of these things, you, no, you won't continue on in them. You'll repent of those things that you've done. And the more you grow in grace and knowledge of the Word of God, the more things you're going to see wherein you ought to set, a, set out of, or get out of, stop living and stop doing your life. And it starts with the way you think and the way you act also. The Jews, therefore, he said, strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They didn't understand that he was, this is an allegory in a sense. It's a story. It's an example. It's, uh, you know, uh, of how... That even as that bread in the wilderness, and the story of it, is an allegory that shows forth that the bread, yes, sustained them physically, but their true hope was in God to sustain them spiritually. And the same is present and true now. And that his flesh, his body, being that which uh, was created, born of a virgin, came into this world to suffer and die on a cross of Calvary to redeem a people unto himself. God has the... The righteousness of God and the shed blood of God could save a billion worlds like this one for a million trillion years. If it was God's will to save such a number and such an existence of people. But that which God had determined before the foundation of the world, he will save. But they didn't understand these things. Just as many today don't understand these things. And there are many today would say, oh, if you don't understand, you know, you know, on the one hand, the Calvinists, or not the Calvinists, but the Catholics say, well, if you don't understand it, it becomes literal flesh and blood, you're without hope. 
And we on the other side would say, no, if you think it becomes a literal flesh and blood, you're deceived. You're a liar. God, if he saves someone from this heresy, they will turn from it. That he'll show them it's not true. They won't be able to continue on in it. That's why there's been many. I mean, even known preachers, Baptist preachers, who used to be Catholic or used to be Methodist or Pentecostal, many other different ones. They walked in many other lines of faith. And God brought them out of those heresies to the truth. He said, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink the blood you have no life in you. And let me say here again if he's literally saying literal flesh, literal blood he's sinning against God. He's breaking God's law. It's not literal. It's symbolic. It's talking about trusting in the Lord and his death, burial, and resurrection to redeem you from your sins and at the end when you take that Lord's Supper you take that bread, you're remembering his suffering on the cross, and before that even, all that he suffered for your sake. You drink that cup, you're remembering the shedding of his blood, which hath redeemed you from all your sins, and without it, there'd be no redemption. It is a symbolic ceremony that as often as we do it, God doesn't say, you've got to do this every week, or every month, or every year, as often as you do it. And it is therefore left up to each church and the pastor of each church is how often to do it because there are conditions on a church being able to do it. If there's discord in the church, if there's disharmony, if there's divisions, if there's sin in the church, then the church should not observe this supper. He says in verse 54, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath, eat, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Again, it's about having faith and trust in the Lord. And as we remember that He is the one who hath redeemed us by His shed blood and by the suffering of His body and the death on the cross, that by the death on the cross we are saved. Not by any other means, not by our works, for our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. There's nothing good of us or in us. The only thing good is that presence of the Holy Spirit of God and the working of the power of God within us to do in, of His good will and pleasure. It's not a literal thing here. It's not like saying literally that you literally eat flesh and you literally drink blood. No. It says, For my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. Yes, there is that loaf. There is that bread that we're to eat. And there is that drink which we're to drink in observance of the Lord's Supper. Just as they, uh, the nation of Israel, in Pentecost, the time of unleavened bread, the Passover, there these traditions, these customs which were given unto them of God, had, they were to eat that unleavened bread and they were to drink the cups of wine. It was not grape juice, brethren. It was not grape juice. And to deny that historical fact is to deny even the very word of God itself. It was not grape juice. They drank wine, and they eat that unleavened bread. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. It's about faith. Having faith in him as you observe that supper, and remember his death, burial, and resurrection, that he was dying for you. And that even as you trust in him, your faith is in him, your salvation is him, your hope is in him, Along with the Holy Spirit of God, He's with you too. The whole Godhead is with you in this work of salvation to keep you unto the day of your redemption when your body will be, you'll either, if you're dead already, you'll be, caught, you'll be given that uh, glorified body. If you're still alive, these old corruptible bodies will be changed. And we'll have glorified bodies that have never known sin. It says in verse 57, as the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. He keeps referring to the one who sent him, the Father, which is in heaven, who sent him. If he sent himself, if he sent and said, oh, I'm going to send myself down there, and I'm going to go down there, and then I'm going to say, hey, I, I, sent, I, you know, I sent myself, even though I'm saying somebody else sent me. It's dishonest. It's a lie. You make God to be a liar. 
if you don't believe this exactly the way it's wrote. And we've been preaching on all these things. We've been preaching on the three that are one for quite some time now, so it's all kind of running together. And it all does. It all comes together. It's all the Word of God, and it ties itself together. If you deny on one part, you deny also on others. But the Father, which is in heaven, he says it's the, the, as the living Father. He's not a dead God. He is a living God. He is the only one true living God who does have these three distinct persons of himself, these three faces of God, these three aspects of God that are distinct persons, or even Christ refers over the will of the Father and talks about his own will, says, I did not come to do my own will, I came to do the will of him that sent me, the will of the Father. Christ is saying, yes, I have a will, but I came to do the will of the Father. He says, this is a bread which came down from heaven now. He came down from heaven. He was the word that was with God before the foundation of the world, and that body of flesh was made for him to abide in he came down from heaven, the I Am, the Lord, the Old Testament, took up his abode in that body which was prepared for him. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. Let me say to you, you can observe the Lord's Supper every day of your life. And if you have not faith within you, if you've not been born again, you'll still die and go to hell. You'll still be dead just as they were. That which, that which they physically ate did not save them in the end. The same true is true here. That which we physically drink and eat, this supper, which we physically eat and drink, has no saving grace. It has no means to save you from your sins. Christ died once for all. And you had to put your faith in his death, burial, and resurrection, Trusting that he suffered, died, was buried, and rose again to redeem you from your sins. Everyone has to think that, believe that, to be saved. We have to acknowledge that in our hearts and minds and profess it before others also. If we can't profess it before others, we don't have it. He which came down from heaven, who was with the Father before the foundation of the world, was called the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and that's his name, as we see in the book of Revelation. He is the Word of God. And this written Word of God, the Bible, is God's Word to us. This is his, this is his two wills. His two testaments are in here. First, the Old Testament, the New Testament. It's the will of God toward us. So we might know what his will is. It's not all the wisdom and knowledge of God. It's only that which God gave us. It says, These things said he in the synagogue, as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, and he said unto them, Does this, work, does this offend you? And, it, and, if, and, what, and, what, and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, well, we're going to stop there because we are quickly running out of time here now. But he which came down from heaven, who was with the Father before the foundation of the world, came down to have that body which was prepared for him, that flesh, that body which was prepared, was to suffer and die for our sakes, to redeem us from our sins. And that's what the supper is for. Memorial, remember that. Brethren, may God keep you, my friends, may God keep you until we meet again.